The next reading of Holy Scripture this morning comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 20. People of God, stand for the reading of Scripture. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. This is God's Word. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, Immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. So far the reading of God's holy word, we give thanks for it. You may be seated. And as we turn to consider this portion of scripture, let us pray for God's help. O Lord, our God, we are thankful for your word. The word that through Christ Jesus you sow in our hearts. That you distribute the gospel message to us. And we ask that today might be a day when it grows up 30, 60, 100 fold in the lives of all your people. We are glad that even in familiar and yet tricky passages 
that you speak peace to your people. And we pray that you might grant us new insight into a portion of your word that perhaps many, most, if not all here, have thought about to some degree or other before. But we pray today we would see the richness of Christ's glory and grace afresh. Overcome the deficiencies of the preacher. They are many. And bless the reading and the preaching of your word to bring forth fruit in our hearts to love you more, to serve you better. We ask it all for the sake of the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. When I would uh, get sick as a boy and stay home from school, uh, I'd usually, you know, that kind of like gap between when you wake up naturally and go to take another nap later uh, in the day when you're homesick, it's right in that time frame and I'd end up watching the famous game show, The Price is Right. Right? And you'll know that most of the games on that show involve, you know, guessing correct prices for household items, vacations, or brand new cars. Um, But, but the perhaps one exception amidst all that is the game Plinko. Right? Chance-based, making players drop a, a round chip down a chute where it bounces around and they hope that it lands on a high dollar prize at the bottom of the playing board. And now some players, you know, kind of sit there and, and think about it and try to plan their drop carefully as if it does any good uh, to maximize their chances to win. Now regardless of that, nonetheless, they're going to win something only if they just drop the chip, right? You have to play it if you're going to get anything. And the chip falls where it falls, but the player's job is to drop their token. And in Mark 4, 1 to 20, the parable of the sower, well, there Jesus spoke of how seeds are planted, but has but have different results because they fall on different types of soil. Many have likely heard this parable before, even quoted colloquially of some sorts, but probably having a focus on the four types of soil with questions concerning what each type of soil represents about the people who are hearing the gospel or... Even questions about ourselves and these soils, right? Now we, today, are going to reconsider that approach. After all, this parable is almost always, if you look in your Bible, I would be willing to guess that it is there, designated as the parable of the sower, not the soils. If we look too much at the soil, well, we miss the parable's central point, namely the person distributing seeds. And just like Plinko players cannot worry where their chips will fall, but simply must drop their token to win, so too the gospel does not advance if we worry too long about where we might drop it. Gospel seeds must simply be thrown with prayer for successful growth. Our main point today is that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God comes in profuse distribution of the gospel. God's kingdom comes in profuse distribution of the gospel. And we're going to think about this together in three points. The parable of planting, the purpose of planting, and the power of planting. So first, let's think together about the parable of planting. And, and really what we're trying to do here is get, a, get our heads around what's going on with parables in general. Right, so as we study through Mark, chapter 4 begins this new turn in the story with a block, a bundle of parables grouped 
together. And these stories that all teach something, and this is important, all of these teach something about the nature, the character of God's kingdom and the way it is present in the world today. Mark's Gospel has taught us about this divine kingdom from multiple angles, all pointing to how God's kingdom is in Christ, bringing redemption from sin and its effects. This first point then is, is about considering how to understand what parables do, what function they have in Jesus' teaching in Mark's Gospel. So why, why did Jesus begin using parables here? So if you'll jump down, we're going to take this a little bit out of order. So if you jump down to, to verses 10 and 11, we'll read this. And, and when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables, right? He started using them. What are you doing, Jesus? And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. And so the parables are explicitly about the secret of God's kingdom, and only those who follow Christ truly understand it. Sometimes I think that we um, imagine that Jesus used parables as illustrations to clarify his message. You know, this is a helpful teaching device to kind of give a, a real-world example of how this works. But here, Christ oppositely, oppositely said that parables are to keep the secret of the kingdom from those who won't believe. It's like when you're a kid, right? And your parents would spell... <laughs> Rather than say a word to keep you out of the loop, honey, do you want some C A K E? I think the kids need a B A T H. Right? The message is clear for those who have the right capacities to understand, but hidden to those who don't have the correct insight. And in Mark, all but his closest disciples lack the insight of faith. And to some degree, they're still confused, right? But they lack faith, the needed capacity to understand God's kingdom and these, this particular way of teaching about it. If that's the case, why then? Why then would Jesus teach in such a way as to conceal his message? Now, here's, here's the thing, and I think this is, is sometimes tricky. Because Jesus spoke about his kingdom in these veiled terms as an act of judgment against those entrenched in unbelief. It, it was like giving them the, the silent treatment while also still teaching his true followers. Jesus implemented parables, I mean, if, if you remember back from, from two weeks ago, uh, and, and before that, this, this successive string of events of confrontation culminating in the events of Mark 3 about the story of the unforgivable sin. Right? They had entrenched themselves so strongly in unbelief. Religious leaders recognized Jesus as God's Son, doing the Messiah's work, and despite recognizing Him as such, still accused Him of working for the devil. In reaction to this thorough hardness of their hearts, Jesus began teaching in parables. Parables are then an a judgment against those who will refuse to accept Christ for who he is, but they do, in fact, prove to be a help for those who follow him because they are the way that Jesus teaches us the kingdom. Final question about kind of the, the scope of, of using parables here. What, what does Jesus' quotation from Isaiah 6 add 
to his point uh, about parables and the secret of God's kingdom. Now, here's one of the things that's interesting here. This, this isn't an out-of-context citation by any means. Jesus quoted this Old Testament passage that was about God's kingship to teach about. To teach about what God's kingdom has and really always will be like in this age. And as Andy Longway taught us last Sunday night very well, uh, Isaiah 6 is about how even when the earthly throne is empty, God reigns from his throne in heaven. And Isaiah had this grand vision of God in his throne room, namely the Son on the throne prompting Isaiah to call, send me. And Jesus' citation of Isaiah 6, 9 to 10, which falls right on the back end of that, shows how God's kingdom has all, the way that it has always been received on earth. God's message will go forth, but be rejected by the worldly minded. That is the way it has and remains to be in this age, as God grows his kingdom in the way that he does. Now, to connect the dots even further, try to bring this down to the bottom as close as we can, by by citing Isaiah's prophecy that people will reject his kingdom's message, Jesus, Jesus explained how, not that, right? So Jesus explained how, the way that, parables demonstrate the way that his kingdom arrives. They are about the manner of the kingdom's arrival. By teaching in parables, Christ judged unbelievers because parables hide his kingdom. The parable of planting regards how the veiled character of parables shows the manner of of God's kingdom's presence in the world. It's hard to see, often rejected, comes in secret, and might seem irrelevant to the worldly minded. And that brings us to our second point. The purpose of planting. So we've thought about the parable of planting, trying to get our heads around just kind of the the way that parables work in Mark's gospel. And now this point... The purpose of planting turns to this parable itself, specifically showing how, although most people rush to to ask, which soil am I, this parable emphasizes the sower. In verses 1 to 9, Jesus tells a story about a sower scattering seeds the seeds falling on various soils and differing qualities of plants growing. Because then in verses 10 to 12, the disciples did not understand, Jesus then explained the parable in verses 13 to 20. So that's just the structure and scope of what's going on there. Now, in verse 14... Jesus tells us that the the seeds represent God's word, the gospel message, and and locks attention on the sower's seed. The kingdom of God comes to earth in the profuse, profuse distribution of God's word, resembling a sower walking down the road, indiscriminately scattering seeds. Since the kingdom of God arrived in Christ, he is is the principal or the, the main sower bringing God's kingdom. He is the gardener king who came to plant his kingdom's seeds. When we recognize Christ as the principal sower, we appreciate that this parable describes how God's kingdom is present in the world today, describes its manner of being present 
in this age. So in our historical period since Christ's coming, God's kingdom exists and grows by spreading the word of the gospel. God's plan for his kingdom in our time until Jesus returns is characterized by seed scattering. It's the season of planting. And the sower came spreading seeds indifferently. Right? Not, not stopping to see if the soil was ready for the seed. Jesus sowed gospel seeds indifferently. Not pausing to see if people were ready for the message, but simply proclaiming it. And under the principal sower's supervision, direction, and example, the church still has our role to play in distributing seeds. In this respect, I think, we, I, I, I think it's important to kind of pull out the implication here. In this respect, we are all gifted very differently. And yet the church as church has the call to be scattering seeds. Most Christians, I think, have the simple role of needing to invite family, friends, and neighbors to church where gospel seeds are being abundantly dropped. In other words, everybody has the chip to play where they can sort of try to push people under the the font of seeds falling. Some feel able to speak more confidently and directly about the gospel to people, spreading seeds directly yourselves. But whatever your abilities you have, right, you should feel affirmed, equipped, and encouraged. Just like in Plinko, your only chance to win at all is to play your chip. And so, believer, don't be afraid of using whatever outlet you have for seed planting. Not feeling burdened. It is not your job to feel burdened to know on what sort of soil your seeds are falling. This, This parable doesn't call us to that. Regardless of which way you might be equipped to get gospel seeds to people, Jesus' example as the sower shows that the kingdom of God is present now in the profuse and indiscriminate distribution of the gospel. Our concern is not with demographic studies about how open to the gospel a particular area might be. This parable doesn't teach us to ask what sort of soil people are, but teaches us that the kingdom of God distributes the gospel without regard to what type of soil is around it. We just keep scattering seeds. This passage's major thrust is the sower throwing seeds wherever he can with no interest in what kind of soil it lands upon. The area where I pastored in Northern Ireland was was very agricultural. People had the seasons and environmental conditions on their minds forefront because everyone at least knew someone whose livelihood depended on those factors. Farmers put massive efforts into preparation for seed sowing. And then the, the, the wait to see how crops would fare was often long and hard, anticipating how fruitful their investments would be. And the thing is, no matter how much effort had been put into planting, into the way of planting, into the preparation for planting, regardless, some time of waiting and hoping that their labors would prove fruitful had to occur. It's the way of things. And our era in God's kingdom is like that. Waiting in the season when we do not yet see all the fruits. This this is, in other words, the season for planting, for sowing, not yet for harvesting. 
So this parable less summons you to ask yourself what sort of soil you are than sets a paradigm for the church. Do we play our Plinko chips? Do we drop our seeds? Our responsibility is to follow the sower's example, distributing the seeds of God's word profusely and indiscriminately. And the purpose of planting is to get God's word in the ears of as many people as possible and to expose everyone to the gospel truth, regardless of how we might think that they will receive it. And that brings us to our final point. The power of planting. The power of planting. And now we're focusing here in this point on what happens. What happens when those gospel seeds get planted in people's lives? When we plant a seed, no matter what someone's reaction might be, well, they are forced to engage with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Note well how how the parable of the sower uh, tells of each of the four soils reacting in a specific way to the seed. Right? But even when it reacts to prevent the seed from growing, the soil still has to deal with the seed. And the same is true for us in that no matter how a person responds when we present the good news of Christ to them, they have to interact with the message about who Jesus is and what he has done. Now, notice further how all the seeds here do what they do really by their own power, right? Other factors act upon the seeds at times, but each grows in the way that it does by its own strength. And such it is with the gospel. The gospel, the gospel is the powerful sort of seed that can even turn dead soil into a fertile field. And so God's kingdom comes into the world today through seed scattering, through confronting people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we consider this parable from the outsider's perspective, right, the, the sower becomes all the more striking. I think the, the worldly-minded would probably think that a man walking down the road throwing seeds everywhere <laughs> seems a little bit crazy. The worldly minded likely think that this sower was irrelevant. Christ's parable teaches that God's kingdom is like that, though. It seems irrelevant to those who want something else. But it comes planting seeds in truth of highest relevance. Our measuring stick for the kingdom of God is not how important Our cultural elites think we are. After all, the cultural elites crucified our king, didn't they? Shockingly, in Jesus' day, the worldly-minded thought that God's kingdom would come creating a religious culture, overturning the Roman Empire with a government run by the religious leaders. The Pharisees were the ones who buddied up with the Herodians. And that focus on political hopes caused them to miss the greatest treasure. God's kingdom itself, arriving in its glorious king, Jesus Christ. Makes me wonder if we need to think about the kingdom less like flowers than peanut plants. You know my fondness for peanuts already, but nonetheless, flowers bloom ostentatiously above ground, displaying their blossoms. Peanuts grow under the surface. 
producing substance that nourishes people, even though they're hard to see. The fruits of God's kingdom may be hard to see sometimes. Jesus said that his kingdom teaching would be seen but not perceived, heard but not understood. Our job is not to demand the harvest, but to know that the real kingdom work is the work of planting and planting the word of God. And so, believer, take heart in this. Take heart in this. Do not be discouraged when the world around us does not look like God's kingdom. This parable doesn't teach us that it will. As we were reminded in our, as Mark reminded us in our prayer, we are not home. This world is not our home. We are pilgrims here. Pilgrims, though, that have an amazing, everlastingly relevant task. The sower seems to dump massive amounts of seeds on each plot of soil. That seems to be the impression, right? And that is the church's calling with our family, friends, and neighbors. We keep planting seeds in people's hearts. We keep putting the news about Christ in front of them. We can follow up and water seeds with acts of service and answering questions, but at the end of the day, we repeat the same little seed, the same message about Christ is the one who died to forgive our sin and rose from death to guarantee our everlasting life. The power of planting is that we confront people with the message of Christ, who is our king and is able to make gospel seeds grow by his strength, tilling the rocky ground of our hearts into fertile soil by the Holy Spirit's work. Our efforts in seed planting just bring people in contact with the gospel. The power of planting is to force people to wrestle with the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. The parable summons us to focus on the sower, Jesus Christ. I think too many people read this parable and think about themselves. Too many believers park their thoughts in the wrong questions. Have I deceived myself into thinking I'm the rich soil? Am I a thorn patch where the gospel will be quenched? Beloved. Beloved, you have misunderstood this parable if you leave today thinking about yourself. Because this parable locks our attention on this central figure who comes to different soils who comes to all sorts of people offering them that life that sprouts into evident fruits the only question we should be asking ourselves right now is how have I responded to that sower because the sower is God's true son Jesus Christ who came, to he- who came from heaven because none of us were able to till our own hearts well enough to make us right with God. Christ didn't come to lay astroturf as if his goal was to paper over the whole world to make it look like his kingdom. He came to put the seed of salvation directly into your heart and to make you right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. Believer, you should know that the church is not only God's kingdom, but also God's garden. And in this garden, our king died to rescue his vines. The soil that produces the rich blossoms of reconciliation with God and growth in godliness is watered by the blood of Jesus, shed for the remission of your sins. And the church is also a garden where new plants are very welcome. We are glad 
to have the vines transplanted from rocky soil to live here with us. Christ is our heavenly sower, and he is the gate into this garden, the one in whom we find all our strength, the one who gives richly to his people, and the one who channels his own life to us that we might live and live forever with him when he brings the full outward glory of his kingdom from heaven and grants it to us by his grace. Let us pray. Father God, we are thankful that Christ came as the one planting the good news for all of his people. We are thankful that the kingdom of God has arrived in someone profusely distributing the good news. We are thankful that Jesus Christ is our sower, able to make his seeds grow, because he is the king equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray that today we would leave considering this parable, not thinking more about ourselves, not asking what, what soil are we, but thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ the sower who gives the harvest, and the one now who has planted the seed of salvation amongst his church. We are thankful to belong to him. And so we pray in his name. Amen.